am your host, Dr. Jack Braha, and welcome to the MedCast Plus Show. On the show, we will feature local community professionals who are experts in their respective field and who will share their experiences and wisdom so we as a community can learn more about health and wellness. My guest today is Ilya Perloff. He is a physical therapist here servicing the South Brooklyn community. Welcome to the show, Ilya. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for coming and uh, helping us educate our community about physical therapy, and we're going to talk about a broad range of topics today. Yes. First, tell us about yourself. Where are you from originally? Where were you born? So I'm, I'm originally from Russia. I grew up in Moscow, Russia. I'm born there. I moved here when I was about 11 years old, um, and then I went to school out here at University of Buffalo for my undergrad in exercise physiology. And I got my doctorate in, uh, in uh, physical therapy at Utica College as well. So I've been servicing for the past seven years the Brooklyn, South Brooklyn community. And um, <laughs> so um, South Brooklyn area is mm -hmm. where you're living now mm -hmm. and you're working here. Tell us a little bit about your degree in exercise physiology. What is exercise physiology? So exercise, everybody needs to exercise and we know that, but there's good ways of doing it and bad ways of doing it. A lot of people actually go to the gym and get injuries, so our job would be to prevent injuries, to exercise people that have special conditions, such as heart condition, neurological conditions, and basically get people to their goals. So they're not just going to do the treadmill for an hour, that they have an actual goal and they're reaching that goal within the, a lot of time. So you're studying a way of taking the individual patient, creating a plan for them. Mm -hmm. So if someone's out there with cardiac disease or obesity, diabetes, you're able to customize. That's correct, yes, because not everybody can follow the same exact plan and things need to be tweaked for them to, be, to do it safely most of the time. And so after you studied exercise physiology and you got your college degree, you mm -hmm. went on and actually studied, from what I understand, another few years mm -hmm. to become a doctorate of physical Therapy. Tell us a little bit about what physical therapy also is and how many years did you spend training? So I spent three years studying, um, getting my doctorate in physical therapy. Uh, physical therapy is really dealing with pain. We try to improve patients' function, reduce their pain, and bring them back to normal after an injury or a chronic condition that they're dealing with. Most of the time it's back pain related, sometimes it's neck pain. We also deal with strokes, cardiac conditions, and so on. So there's a lot of different varied conditions that we deal with. You mentioned the common condition that we see in practice. I have seen a number of patients who suffer from back pain, and it seems like at least half the patients that we see have suffered or are suffering from some sort of back pain. Tell us about what causes back pain most commonly for the viewers watching us today. So back pain is really, really common in America. Usually it's the second uh, most common reason people go to the doctor in America. And under the age of 45 is the leading cause of disability in people. Uh, and the majority of the time, almost 80% of Americans will experience back pain at least once in their life. Um, a lot of times the causes vary. Most of the time it could be a bulging disc when people experience that during the young years. And sometimes during the older years people do experience um, uh, arthritis, uh, slippage of the, the vertebrae, stenosis, and scoliosis, and so on. Right, so it, it could depend on age, what the most common cause is, discs you mentioned, mm -hmm. and as we get older, maybe some wear and tear on the joints, Absolutely. like arthritis. Uh, and when we mention arthritis, are we talking about osteoarthritis OA, which is more wear and tear, mm -hmm. or are we talking rheumatoid, which is a different type of arthritis where the body is attacking the joints? Most of the time it's osteoarthritis because we use our joint, because most of the time it's because of sitting properly and proper body mechanics can cause uh, wear and tear on the discs, and the discs get loaded unevenly throughout life. So that wear and tear can usually cause the bulging of the disc. The bulging of the disc for a while can cause uh, irritation of the joint, and the irritation of the joint leads to arthritis. So it's usually the osteoarthritis part. So osteoarthritis, a very common cause, and this is almost what we're doing to ourselves, the wear and tear, our daily lives mm -hmm. of getting up, walking to the train station, getting on the subway, sitting, standing, maybe improperly lifting things at work or at home. When someone comes into my office as a physician with back pain, I'm often perplexed. I don't know where to start. Sometimes it's a mild back pain, which may just be from an incident that I feel will get better with maybe some Motrin or Advil, what we call NSAIDs. And other times patients tell me it's been going on forever. When is the right time to say, hey, listen, maybe a physical therapy evaluation is a good idea? 
So most of the time, initially, people should go to physical therapy because we're more of a, a conservative treatment path where we use heating, uh, we use massaging, we use exercising, we use proper, teach people proper body mechanics and proper posture so to prevent that from happening again. If that doesn't work, usually then people go to pain management and get medications or shots. Um, and if that doesn't work, usually people end up going to surgeries. But most of the time, physical therapy is the key in treating the back pain. Right, so there are approaches to people with back pain. It could be a hands-on therapy, physical mm -hmm. therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, we, you mentioned injection therapy or pain management, whether they're taking a medication, whether they're using a medicine that's injectable where a physician injects mm -hmm. a certain type of medication. And then surgery, of course, is, is uh, for many folks a last resort, but a needed, needed resort. So when someone comes to your office and they say, hi, I have back pain, and I'm sure many of our viewers today are sitting home, they might even be feeling some back pain right now. Where do you start? How do you approach the, the patient on their first visit? And what is it like? So we try to figure out what is the actual cause of their back pain, which, which activities are they doing during the day that can cause the damage to the spine, um, and we try to figure out how we could prevent it from happening. Then, of course, we try to deal with symptoms. We want to alleviate the symptoms so that they're comfortable while their back is initially healing up in the acute stages. Um, after that, of course, we try to teach them exercises and bring back normal motion so that they realize what they can, what they cannot do, and hopefully prevent it from happening over and over again throughout their life. So many of these folks who I see, and I'm sure you're uh, encountering them as well, who have obesity or suffer from being overweight and they also have back pain, many of them say to me, it's hard for me to get in the gym now to start losing weight or exercising mm -hmm. and losing weight because of the back pain. And so we know what's causing it is the overweight state. Back pain can't be treated because they can't get in the gym to lose the weight. How do you approach that type of a patient? Well, most of the time people have this misconception that weight loss is all uh, activity related. So you need to be more active in order to lose the weight. But that's really what the food companies want us to believe. Unfortunately, 80% of weight loss comes from the proper diet. Uh, if you, you eat properly during the day, then you don't have to work out as much to lose that weight. Um, so really the diet comes into effect first. And then we show them small exercises that they could do maybe without injuring that part of the body, working more the legs, more the arms, and not really concentrating on the core yet until the disc is ready or until the low back is not hurting them as much so to, to start the core strengthening. So someone out there watching today who is overweight really wants to lose the weight following the diet, looking to get that extra kick from exercise, but has an injured leg or an injured arm on one side and says, hey, I can't go to the gym because of that. If they come and meet with you, you can actually formula, uh, formulate a plan to avoid the injured area of the body but still achieve good exercise? Absolutely. We try to figure out what works for them, what doesn't work for them. It takes us anywhere from six to ten sessions usually to kind of approach and figure out what patients like, what patients don't like. And then we figure out if it works and doesn't work for them. And after a while, they figure out a plan that works and they take it on for themselves for hopefully anywhere from two to four months for muscles to start growing and anywhere from six months to a year for them to fully grow. So it does take quite a while and you need to really figure out what works for you so you could do it every day for at least 10 or 15 minutes a day. Patients have to realize this is a long road, but th they have to start somewhere. And so what you're saying is basically that if they come in and meet with you, over the course of a few sessions, not only can you help them with possibly the injured area of the body, the injured bone or the injured muscle, but develop a exercise plan that can accommodate that injury while not ignoring the rest of the body. And that's very important for our viewers to know is that just because there is an injury doesn't mean that they have to avoid the gym completely. So we talked about diet, we talked about exercise and achieving weight loss to help with back pain, but there are plenty of folks out there that are eating the right diet, they're running marathons, they're not overweight, yet they still suffer from back pain. Tell me some other causes that you see very commonly and what we might be able to, to do about it. So actually most of the time we see in the younger years, it's more the active, it's more the physically, um, pe people that are actually physically active that get these uh, back pain issues. Uh, most of the time, I see, sometimes I see patients anywhere from 14 to 16 year old girls, anywhere from over 70 that have the, the back pain issues. 
Um, so it's really most of the causes come initially is due to poor body mechanics. So we, pour, we never bend our knees when we bend down to pick something up off the floor. We always tend to kind of just lean forward. And we don't really realize that the big muscles in the legs are meant to lift stuff and to pick stuff up. The small muscles in the back, they're really just meant to hold us up during the day. So you really have to figure out what, what is doing the wrong thing for you so that you can do more right. But still, it does occur. Back pain is one wrong move, one wrong twist is always going to cause it. And uh, you just need to learn how to deal with it throughout your life. Also, sitting down. A lot of us are sitting down at work most of the time. If, pe if people usually sit for, say, eight hours a day at their, their work desk all day and they don't stand up, that will cause back pain sooner or later. So we teach them ways to kind of get up, move around, to, to kind of oppose the bad posture that they're creating all day. Right, so in my field, I'm walking around sometimes all day, sometimes I'm doing procedures, and then there are times when I'm sitting doing paperwork. And interestingly enough, I, I just got an Apple Watch, and all of a sudden it vibrated and said, it's time for me to stand up. If someone's at work all day, they have a desk job, they're on the phone, computer work, how often should they be getting up, and what should they be doing, and for how long? So of course, sitting is the most important thing, how we sit at work. So we need to have an, a comfortable chair where you can move all the way back into that chair. Your feet are supposed to be flat on the floor, not tilted or not in front of you. Uh, you should also have the computer screen right in front of you so that the way you're not turning your neck side to side. And of course, we recommend anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours is okay to sit in one spot. Uh, but anywhere, anything after that, we always recommend for them to get up, walk around, oppose the posture. So at, at minimum 30 minutes, and maximum of two hours. And you mentioned a key word here that I've heard before, which is oppose the posture. And in the gym, we we're taught that on days when you push, you should pull. When we're using our biceps, do a little bit of triceps, sort of the pluses and minuses of the muscle. Explain that to us about opposing the posture and how that could apply to other parts of the body. So balance is very important in the spine. We consider that most of our movement is happening in front of us. So we're always bending down, we're always sitting. It's, there's a lot of flexion in the spine. So you, the idea is as much of flexion or uh, bending you have, that's as much extension or bending backwards you should have. So it's, it's really sh should be for people that tend to do repetitive postures over the whole the same day. It's also not the best for people to stand all day. People that stand all day end up having facet injuries, which is the little joint on the back of the spine that causes irritation, swelling, and, point, uh, and pressure on the nerve. So really, you have to find a perfect balance between standing, sitting. It, it's kind of like a, the day should be spread out, and, and a balance should be out throughout the whole day.